In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we thank you for the reminder that heaven is so precious and the glories of heaven are indescribable. And whatever it will take for us to spend eternity with you, we should make sure that nothing hinders us from getting to heaven. Because if we miss heaven, it will be more than crime. Therefore, Lord, we pray that you will prepare every one of us that will throw everything behind us so that at all cost you will hold our hand we will hold on to your hand and we will make it finally on that wonderful day in jesus name not only that we'll get to heaven we want to take multitudes with us to heaven as well in jesus name help every one of us to escape the judgment of the lost the damned and the doomed so that we'll have your peace here on earth and your everlasting rest in heaven open our eyes once again as we come before the pages of the scriptures now in jesus name we pray we are back to the general epistle of jude we have already learned that this is part of the inspired writings in scripture although it is short the message is not less than the message of the other books of the bible in fact it has a place in the bible that no other book of the bible can replace it has its own distinct message of warning for the church and of warning for the careless who might be outside the church we're looking at verses 11 through to 16 today as we look at these verses the verses might appear very simple but just as it is the word of god the might of god is very deep look at them verse 11 woe unto them talking about the apostates talking about those who have departed from the faith talking about those who have denied the lord that bought them talking about the ungodly men that crept in on awares talking about the people that have not taken heed to the warning of scripture concerning the sodomites and the fallen angels as well as the redeemed israels that fell israelites that fell he said these who have neglected the warnings of scripture and have departed away from the lord warned to them they have gone in the way of cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam and for, re for reward and perished in the gain saying of Cori. These are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about with of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead plowed up by the roots raging waves of the sea forming out their shame their own shame wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever and enoch also the seventh from adam prophesied of these saying behold the lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all the ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him these are murmurers complainers walking after their own lusts 
and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, serving men's persons in admiration because of advantage. That's part of the that's part of the epistle, and it is the part we're studying today. It talks about Cain, it talks about Balaam, it talks about Korah, and then he uses descriptive language, looking into the realm of nature. It talks about them as trees that have withered fruits plucked out uh, by the root. It talks about them as waterless cloud, that is clouds without water. It talks about them as wandering stars who are plunging into the blackness of darkness forever. And then it says that the prophecy of Enoch has been fulfilled in them. And then it says judgment is going to come upon them. And once again, before he leaves that subject, he describes them as the murmurers and the complainers and the people that are walking in their own laws and the people that are speaking great swelling words. And that's because of flattery, because they have men's persons and admiration for only one purpose. They want to make an unlawful gain out of them. As we look at these verses, we see very clearly that the verses are talking of judgment. And when we talk of judgment, we need to understand that the inspired writers of the scripture, they have always faithfully warned their hearers of the severe and discern judgment of God awaiting sinners. But um, Jude particularly is concentrating on the judgment upon the apostates. And he will not be the only one to talk about the judgment awaiting the apostates. In the um, Old Testament, you understand that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and in some little portions in Aramaic. But there was a version translated into Greek, the Septuagint version. And in the Septuagint version, uh, the uh, name of apostates, they are mentioned. That is, apostates as a noun. Those who have forsaken the Lord, those who have departed from the Lord. And as we examine those references in scripture, the references referring to those who went away from the Lord who forsook the Lord, who apostatized, that is, who departed so much away from the Lord, they are not able to come back. You'll find that there had been the pronouncement of judgment against them. And of course, when you come into the New Testament, the New Testament is very full of the people that have departed from the Lord or that will depart from the Lord, and the judgment of God comes upon them. Talking about the apostates in particular, and the judgment that will come upon them let us look at hebrews in hebrews chapter 6 reading from verse 4 for it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the holy ghost and have tasted the good word of god and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away it's talking about the people that knew the Lord before. And it's telling us some specific things about them. Number one, they were once enlightened. All sinners have been in darkness. But these came out of the darkness. They were enlightened. Number two, they tasted of the heavenly gift taste and see that the Lord is good. These people knew of the goodness of God, of the grace of God, of the loving kindness of God. They tasted of the heavenly gift. Number three, they were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. These were the people that received the Holy Ghost in the past. And number four, they tasted of the good word of God, the goodness of the word, the power in the word, the enlightenment in the word, the cleansing in the world, the experience in the past, and even the powers in number five, the powers of the world to come. The supernatural had been in their lives before. Now it says, if they fall away, remember once again, falling away is deeper and greater and farther than just ordinary falling. They backslid, they remain in that backsliding with perpetual backsliding and then they now con continue to deny the word of God, the word of faith that could bring them back, they denied. They have not only fallen, they are falling away. It's impossible if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh. 
It's a new thing they did now, and they put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh the rain in the rain that cometh out upon it and bringeth forth herbs, meat for the meat for them by whom it is dressed, receive a blessing from God. But that we bear it thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be born. There you find the judgment of God upon the people that fell away and they remained away from the Lord. They remained in apostasy. It says whose end is to be born in Hebrews chapter 10. From verse 26, for if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. These are people that once had received the knowledge of the truth, and they accepted the truth. And there was a time when the truth coming into them made them free. But now after that, they sinned willfully. It says there remains no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. These were the beloved of the Lord before. They were justified. They were friends of the Lord. They had received of the grace of God. But then they turned away from the Lord. They went far away from the Lord. And they became adversaries. And there is very indignation going to devour them. In verse 28, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy on the two. Or three witnesses of how much sorrow punishment. Suppose he... Shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified? He was sanctified, you know. He knew the Lord, you know. He was set apart for God. He was consecrated to God. He was dedicated to God and to the things of the Lord. There was a time he was dead to sin. There was a time he loved the Lord. There was a time he loved the word of God. He was sanctified, but now he has trodden underfoot. The Son of God. He has counted that blood that sanctified him before an unholy thing and has done despite unto the spirit of grace. For we know him that has said, Vengeance is mine. Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. And for the apostates in verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 25, See that she refuse him not that speaketh. For if they escaped not, who refused him that spake on earth much more? Shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? Verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. And so you will see that the scriptures uh, vividly talks about the terrifying punishment and the terrifying judgment and indignation that will come upon those who fall and remain in that fallen condition, upon those who fall away, who depart from the faith and become apostates and they do not return unto the Lord. Now Jude has been talking about this judgment. In Jude verse 6, it speaks about the judgment of the great day. In Jude verse 7, it talks about the vengeance of eternal fire. And in Jude verse 13, it talks about the blackness of darkness forever. Apostates will suffer in hell fire. When we talk about hell fire, there are some so-called preachers. They are so loving and they are so kind that they can never bring themselves to talking about hellfire. But when you think of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you cannot be more loving than Jesus, when you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, our loving Savior, he had more to say on hell than any other person in Scripture. He speaks of the danger of hell in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. 
it tells us that hell is so severe that the loss of a limb is nothing in comparison to suffering in hell fire. Matthew chapter 5 verses 29 and 30. In Matthew chapter 7 verses 15 and 19, he warns that false prophets will be cast into the fire. In Matthew chapter 8 verse 12, he describes hell as outer darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In Luke chapter 12 verses 4 and 5, he calls us to fear God who has the power to cast sinners into hell. In Matthew chapter 13 verses 40 to 42, Jesus, the very Son of God, our loving Savior, he said, not only that sinners will be thrown into hell, all those who offend, causing others to sin, will be cast into the furnace of fire. In Mark chapter 9 verses 43 to 48, Jesus said, the fire is unquenchable and the suffering is everlasting eternal in matthew chapter 26 verse 24 it says annihilation or for those who prefer to call it anni annihilation those who uh, are that it is better it says annihilation will be far better than hell the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventist people, oh, they say when they get, if there's anything like hell, when they get there, you are burnt off, annihilation. Jesus said, if that were the case, that would even have been better. And that means then that there is no annihilation, there is nothing like you get there and then you vanish, you are no more to be seen. It is suffering forever and ever. And it's Jesus Christ that said there will be degrees of suffering in hell. He looked at Chorazin, he looked at Bethsaida, he looked at the places where he had performed the great miracles and they did not repent. He said, it will be better for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for you. Implication is, the Sodomites and the people of Gomorrah will get to hell, but those people in Capernaum and Bethsaida that saw these miracles and they did not repent, hell will be hotter for them. In Luke chapter 12, verses 46, Seven and 48 Jesus said there are those who did not know the will of God they do things that are worthy of punishment they'll be beaten with few stripes they'll still get to hell but those who knew and they have committed those things that are worthy of punishment they'll be beaten with many stripes what Jesus is telling us is that the difference in the intensity of suffering in hell is related directly to the light or knowledge of the truth that you have received it said the hottest hell is reserved for those who knew the most and rejected it if you think about that very deeply the apostate will get to the hottest part of hell sinners will be in hell it will be hot hot enough to make them suffer and regret all they have done but then for the apostate for the one that tasted of the goodness of the Lord for the one that was a partaker of the Holy Ghost for the one that saw the goodness and the enlightenment of scripture for the one that tasted of the salvation of the Lord and then fell away from the faith and went away from the Lord if he dies in that condition the hotness of hell the intensity of wrath the intensity of punishment will be greater for that apostate than all the other people that get into hell it's going to be a terrible a terrible thing for apostates in second peter chapter 2 second peter chapter 2 verse 20 for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Because but it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned 
to his vomit again and they saw the pig that was washed to a wallowing in the mire that tells us then it will be terrible for the apostate and apostates as i have told you and as the scripture gives us the record it's one that knew the lord before and experienced much from the lord before but now is turned away from the truth to teach and propagate error and evil the intensity of their future suffering is indescribable unimaginable and unbearable and so it is a very terrible thing for somebody to be an apostate now we're looking at three points today in uh, this message contained in verses 11 through to 16. point number one the pattern and practice of apostates the pattern and practice of apostates number two perversion of present day apostates perversion of present day apostates point number three predicted punishment for apostates predicted punishment for apostates number one the pattern and the practice of apostates in jude verse 11 jude verse 11 warn to them for they have gone in the way of cain and ran greedily after the error of balaam for reward and perished in the gain scene of quarry once again i need to remind you that um, jude was very fond of three points and uh, he was very fond of triplets and again in this verse 11 he mentions three men classic apostates classic rebels classic people that are examples of those who turn away from the truth number one cain number two balaam number three korah written here as Cory. And it says, Woe unto them, because they follow after the pattern and the practice of these three men, Cain, Balaam, and Korah. These three men came under severe judgment before the Lord, and they apostate the pattern, their practice after that of Cain, Balaam, and Korah. If you know the stories concerning Cain, concerning Balaam, concerning Korah, there are three things you will notice. Number one, Cain shows the pride, the hatred, the persecution coming from apostates. His sacrifice had not been accepted. Because of that envy and jealousy, pride and hatred came into him. And it was so much, he persecuted Abel to the point of death. Therefore, Cain shows the pride, the hatred, the persecution from apostates. Balaam illustrates the greed and seduction of apostates. If you know the story about Balaam, you will know that he was covetous. The Lord didn't want him to go and curse the people of Israel, but he was moved and motivated by greed. And when he felt that he might not be able to get the money that Balak wanted to give unto him, he then went through the method of seduction. And he taught Balak how to make the Moabites commit immorality with the Israelites in such a way. Then the judgment of God will come upon the Israelites. Balaam then illustrates the greed and the seduction of the apostates. Korah, on the other hand, reveals the open rebellion and blasphemy of the apostates. Korah, Datan, and Abiram. Those were the three rebels in Israel that opposed visibly, openly, publicly criticizing Moses and Aaron. And therefore, Korah is revealing to us the open rebellion and blasphemy of the apostates in uh, this verse 11. Look at it. Woe to them. 
for they have gone in the way of Cain. They have run in the greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and they perished in the gain seen of um, Korah. You will notice here the progression in evil of the apostate. It says they have gone, just going. And then it says now they are running. And then it says they perished. It is talking about the accelerated pace in the way to hell, in the way of evil of the apostates. The first of all, go gently. And the first of all, just go at the normal pace. But now as they swallow demons and as they are possessed by the devil for satan entered into judas now they run greedily after the error of uh, balaam for reward and eventually they were so eager in serving the devil they perished suddenly in the gain in the gain saying the gain saying there you may not understand as old english the greek is antilogia Anti means uh, against and logos the word. It means against the word. The gain saying of Korah that is the opposition against the truth, the rebellion against the word. They perished in the gain saying of Korah. Examine those uh, three things again. Number one, they've gone in the way of Cain, they rejected the true way. They went in the way of Cain. They rejected the true way. They have run greedily after the error of Balaam. They rejected the truth. Because now they go after Aaron. And they perished in the gain saying of Korah. They forfeited life. The way, the truth, the life. They rejected Christ. Completely, totally. They turned away from the way, they turned away from the truth, they turned away from the life. And so because it's a total rejection of all that Christ is, they have now totally gone away from the Lord. They have nothing to do with the way, they have nothing to do with the truth, they have nothing to do with the life coming from Christ. Now they perished eventually. And so you will see that as uh, we think about uh, these men, the apostates, the verdict is very clear on them. What's the verdict? Woe unto them. As we look at our world today, who can you compare to the apostates? There are the liberals. They have totally rejected the word of God. And they reject all the miracles of the Bible. And all the things that are supernatural and miraculous in the Bible, the liberals and the modernists, they reject. And anything, in fact, right now, it just came out in Europe and America, and they have changed uh, everything in the Bible. They have now put out a new version of the Bible, and they avoid things that uh, relates to our salvation for example crucifixion they have removed the word crucifixion and they now put another word instead of crucifixion they have even removed the that jesus christ was born in the manger now they have uh, put another thing to try to uh, give the idea that it wasn't that bad after all and they have removed quite a lot of things and they are trying to publicize that and push that kind of watered down uh, this kind of bible that doesn't have the power of god anymore doesn't have the truth anymore they are pushing that on their people and uh, well thank god even those who are not born again yet in africa i read about them they are standing against that bible in africa here uh, people that belong to some denominations i don't want to mention when they saw that uh, they said no we are going to fight this even those who do not have jesus as savior they compare that thing they have just produced now they compare it to the bible in their hand and they said no that they will fight it 
if the people that do not know salvation, do not have salvation, are contending for the literal writing of the faith in the Bible. Those of us who are saved and sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost, there is a fight to fight. And we have to fight anything that will take away from the literal word of the word of God he has given into our hands. The modernists and the liberals are going the same way. Do you know also that the charismatics and the prosperity preachers, they are going the way of Balaam. The prosperity preachers, they will preach anything for money. And they want money at all costs. And uh, they turn down salvation. They turn down repentance. They turn down self-denial. They just want everybody to come. And they are promising everybody that whatever they are doing, no qualification, no restriction, the Lord is going to give them blessing and prosperity. These are people that have gone away from the faith. And you know that Balaam, when you study the life of Balaam, his counsel was contrary to his prophecy, prayer, and preaching. You see, when you look at the prophecies of Balaam, and he prophesied about Christ, and he prophesied about Israel, and he prophesied about the goodness and the promises of God for the children of Israel. When you look at the prophecy, they appear correct. So that, but then when you look at the counseling of Balaam, unto Balak what he taught Balak to do against the children of Israel so that they will perish you find that the counseling was totally contrary to the prophecy the preaching and the prayer and uh, there are people like that today they may stand on the pulpit and when they preach you will think there is nothing purer there is nothing more perfect there is nothing that you can find in the word they are preaching that you'll, you'll say that everything is sound doctrine get to them privately and let them counsel you and now when they counsel you they begin to say this is this but and after that but they change what they have preached this is would have been all right except that and after that except that they change the sound doctrine they were preaching before this would have been all right for you to practice, except that you know this is not Nigeria. And because this is not Nigeria, then after that, they give you the counseling. You see, there are people like Balaam, that it's one thing to preach the sound doctrine and to prophesy and even to pray. You know how he prayed? He said, let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. There is no other greater prayer a person can pray in the old covenant or new covenant. Covenant, but to die the death of the righteous is the greatest form and the greatest kind of prayer but he didn't die the death of the righteous let me just show you this in numbers chapter 31 numbers chapter 31 let's read from verse 7 and see about what eventually happened what eventually happened is that there was a war and then Balaam had now to go to one side in Numbers 31 verse 7 and they watch against the Midianites as the Lord commanded Moses and they slew all the males and they slew the kings of Midian beside the rest of them that were slain namely Evi and Rechem and Saul and all and Reba five kings of Midian of Midian Balaam also the son of Baal, they slew with the sword. They didn't go to his house to slay him, to kill him. He joined those people to fight against the children of Israel. And while the war was going on, they killed all those kings and they killed Balaam also. Talk about prophecy, he prophesied. Talk about revelation, he had revelation. Talk about vision, he had vision. And yet here is a man that had such great vision, even talking about the star out of Jacob, that is about Jesus Christ, even with the greatest of prophecies concerning the Messiah, he still perished with the unbelievers. He died the death of an unrighteous man, a backslider, an apostate, a rebel against the Lord. And so Jude tells us that all those that go in the way of Cain, in the way of Balaam, in the way of Korah, it says, woe unto them. I pray you will escape. 
that you will not suffer the fate of the apostates in Jesus' name. Let's go to point number two, the perversion of present-day apostates. In verse 12, these are sports in your fees of charity. Now, the English language says sport, and what you understand sport to mean is something like uh, maybe a stain in the fellowship of the believers. But the, in the original language, that word sport actually means hidden rock. What that means is that you see there is a sea, and the ship is sailing on that sea. And there is a rock, and that rock, the top of that rock, is at the water level, but it is not visible to the sailor. And the rock is mighty, but it is hidden. And while the ship is coming at full speed, it gets across that hidden rock, and the ship is wrecked and shattered and scattered. And so Jude says, these apostates are hidden rocks. They hide among the sea of heads of the believers. And uh, as you are just going your way, you confront them, not knowing that they are not real believers, not knowing that they are just physically present in the church and then they make a shipwreck of your faith they are hidden rocks spots in your feast of charity feast of charity what does that mean you see in those days in the early church many of the believers were poor many of the believers were actually slaves and they didn't have much to eat and therefore there was something called the love feast the feast of charity that the rich people will bring what they have the poor people will bring what they have then they come into the assembly into the fellowship and they now put together everything that they are brought and that was called the feast of charity and everybody will just feed themselves and they will just eat because it is a time of charity and love and feasting among the people of God why don't we do that today in the early church that thing eventually corrupted them if you read the corinthians you'll understand that the rich people now will come together in a group and share what they have and the poor people will get together share what they have that in the fellowship some people were getting drunk and the others were going hungry and then paul the apostle said what have you not houses to eat in are you bringing the church of God into disrepute and shame? And eventually in the early church, they canceled that thing. So that's why you don't find it much into church history and you don't find it today. But at that time, it was there. And these apostates were hiding there in the feast of charity, but they were like hidden rocks. And it says, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear without fear of discovery nobody will discover them then it says clouds they are without water clouds without water carried about of winds trees whose fruit withered without fruit twice dead plucked up by the roots raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame wandering stars who to whom is reserved the darkness of darkness forever here is giving us the description and he's uh, telling us about these apostates now do you notice something in jude in trying to talk about the apostates he had already gone into the realm of the fallen angels then he had gone into the realm of the immoral sodomites then he had gone into the realm of backsliding um, rebellious israelites and then he brought something out to describe the apostates he said apostates they're like the fallen angels he said apostates they're like the immoral sodomites he said those apostates, they were like the Israelites that became Baxili and rebellious. He looked into the realm of angels and men. He, got, he had something to say concerning the apostates. Not only that, he had gone into the realm, into the kingdom of animals. He said they are brute beasts. And he said they are filthy dreamers. You see, he's using all language in the realm of fallen angels, in the realm of redeemed men who backslide, in the realm of sinners who are never born against Sodomites, in the realm of even animals now. In these verse 12 and in verse 13, he comes to the realm of nature. 
He said, did I show you how these apostates are, like the fallen angels and the immoral uh, sodomites and the backsliding Israelites? Let me talk about them and use the picture coming from nature. He talks about them in the realm of nature and he says they are clouds without water. And then he says they are trees with withered fruit. He said these trees, they died before they came alive. They died again, twice dead. They were born again. You know, when you are, before you are born again, you are dead in sins and trespasses. Then you become born again. Then you come alive. If you backslide again, you die now the second time. Twice dead. Born again coming to life and now dying again and they are now twice dead and there is no life at all they are plucked up by the roots it says there is no fruit because there is no root in grace and then it says they are wandering stars and it says they are raging waves that are forming out their own shame when you think about the description of the apostates in all those descriptive languages, you know that the situation and the condition of the apostates are to be pitied very sad indeed. Now let's look at these uh, pictures he's talking about uh, concerning the apostates one by one. The apostates are described in vivid terms with words and expressions from the natural phenomenon. And here are five expressions we need to consider. Number one, the uh, King James Version says sports. But I've told you the original means hidden rocks, causing unsuspected peril of shipwreck of faith and character. It speaks of the danger that apostate pose to unsuspecting believers and the unsuspecting church. You see those apostates sometimes, they don't even go away from the four corners or the four walls of the church. They remain there in the church, keep on coming and keep on singing and keep on praying. Only that they are doing their damage secretly. They are doing their damage uh, among the members of the church who are not aware that these are backsliding apostates. Number two, he calls them clouds without water, waterless cloud, offering false, empty promises to those who are thirsty and are seeking satisfaction, seeking refreshment, and seeking fulfillment. They are promising much, but they are producing nothing. And if you look at Proverbs chapter 25, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 14, whose Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. That is, you are the cloud, but then the rain is not there. The blessing is not there in Second Peter. Peter, reading from chapter 2. In Second Peter chapter 2, verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, if you are looking for vocabulary, you get it with them. If you are looking for some job-breaking words in demonstration of their knowledge of uh, grammar and language and ancient history and everything, you find it with them. If you are looking for somebody that can turn you on, motivate you, and make you feel that the greatest preacher of all time has come, you find it among the apostles because they speak great, swelling words, but they are words of vanity. They are lost through the loss of the flesh and through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. You see, they will promise a lot, but then they do not have anything to offer. Number one, they are hidden rocks. Number two, they are clouds without water. Number three, they are trees whose fruit withereth, twice dead plucked up by the roots. That means they have no fruit because they have no root. It shows the barrenness of apostasy. Apostates are devoid of spiritual life and what they teach cannot produce new life, cannot produce transformation, cannot produce genuine conversion. 
It's not just, it's not that they are not preaching. They are not preaching. They are preaching. It is not that they are not giving out promises. They are giving out promises. It is not that they are not encouraging the people. They are encouraging the people. But they are apostates. And all the promises will not, will not give anything, will not produce anything, will not bring conversion, will not bring new life, will not bring transformation. That's why we ought to be careful. It is not just everywhere they say they are preaching, they are prophesying, they are doing whatever that we are on to. Because these are trees whose fruit withered. If you have been a good fruit before and you had life in you, if you go to the congregation uh, being shepherded by an apostate, you will wither away within a short time. Number four, it says raging waves. Forming out their own shame. That refers to their violent, noisy, shameful utterances and assertions. The apostates are uh, some of the most bold or boldest people you can ever find. When they stand and they talk, they talk with satanic authority. And you know that Satan is not afraid. You know that when Satan talks, he talks boldly. And Satan talks with conviction. You, you couldn't uh, command and you couldn't organize the demons and have a network of principalities and powers if you were timid and fearful. Satan is not timid and fearful. And when these people are possessed by the devil and then he energizes them, he inspires them, you'll find that in their language they could be noisy. And they will have some utterances that will be violent. That the person that has the grace of God will be afraid and say, See the kind uh, of demonstration this person is having. I don't think I can benefit anything from here. You see, they are the people that are raging waves. Very noisy, forming out their own shame. Then it says, wandering stars. Aimlessly following a path that will end in eternal blackness and darkness forever. As you look at all these descriptions and uh, names or uh, things, uh, representations that are used for the apostates, you know, it's a very fearful situation to be an apostate. Now let me take uh, these five things and I want to now compare or contrast. Contrast is better. I want to contrast these apostates with the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, Christ is the rock of our salvation. The apostates are the heathen rocks causing shipwreck of faith. Do you see they, are, they turn their backs on Christ? Do you see they are very much opposed to the Lord? Do you see that they do not know the Lord, they do not have the Lord? Jesus Christ is the rock of our salvation. But these apostates are the hidden rocks that do not build up faith, but they destroy faith. Number two, Jesus makes the bright clouds that give us blessing. That's in Zechariah chapter 10 verse 1. I will make bright clouds and then it will pour showers of rain of the Holy Ghost upon you. Although Jesus is giving us clouds with rain and water, they are clouds without water. The exact opposite. A contrast to the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, Jesus is the tree of life. And we are the branches. And we are bearing fruit as long as we are attached unto the Lord. They, the apostates, are twice dead trees with withered fruit. Number four, Jesus is our shepherd. He leads us beside the still waters. They are restless troubled sea, only foaming out shame. Number five, Jesus is the bright and the morning star that is heralding the coming day, but they are wandering aimless stars preceding the night of eternal darkness. As you think about the apostates, therefore, you understand that these apostates, they have nothing to offer. In fact, uh, come back to Jude. In Jude, now verse 16, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own laws, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. The apostates are murmurers and complainers. 
who are dissatisfied with the truth and the plan of God. They always find something to complain about. Always find something to murmur about. Always find something they cannot agree with. No matter how blessed a meeting might be. No matter how wonderful a ministration might appear to be. No matter how many people are rejoicing, saying we praise the Lord, we praise the Lord. Revival has come. I'm even giving testimony. I never attended what a wonderful meeting, a wonderful meeting like this I never attended. Apostates still have their own criticisms. Even when everybody else is rejoicing, even when everybody else is saying, we praise the Lord, see what the Lord is doing, they have their complaints and they have their murmurings, they are dissatisfied with the truth of God and the plan of God. They speak vain words to seduce people. And their empty words flatter the people to gain favor or support from their prey, from the people they want to hold captive. They say whatever the people want to hear, rather than what needs to be said, so that souls will be saved. We have seen the apostates, how they are vividly described. And we have seen as we look at all these things that there is one prayer for us to pray. That God will help us, we will never backslide. We will never become apostates. If you see the way heaven looks at backsliders, if you see the way heaven looks at apostates, you will never want to be an apostate. You will never want to be a backslider in your life, and you will never be. Now we go to point number three, predicted punishment for apostates. Predicted punishment for apostates. Now Jude, we're reading from verse 11 again. One to them. Not blessing, woe unto them. Not the favor of God, not the grace of God. They've gone too far beyond the day of grace, beyond the mercy of God, beyond even the arena or the realm of the love of God. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. He's telling us, as uh, certainly judgment came upon Cain certainly the judgment will come upon them. They have run in the way greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. And as certainly as the judgment and the wrath of God came upon the greedy Balaam, even so the judgment of God will come upon the apostates and they perished and again sin of Korah. Then it goes on in verse 14. And Enoch also, the servants from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all. Here we find another thing here. You see, uh, every book of the Bible has something to supply that all the other books of the Bible will not supply. Already here you see, we know about Enoch, and we have read about Enoch in Genesis. And there is one thing we read about Enoch in Genesis. When he became 65 years of age, he knew the Lord. He started walking with the Lord for the rest of the 300 years. He was walking with the Lord and the Lord took him away. But then we come to the Hebrews. And Hebrews is going to tell us something now about Enoch that you don't exactly read in Genesis. By faith, Enoch, please God, he walked with God. Therefore, you have the faith of Enoch lifted up and shown forth to the Christian church. And yet, there's something Hebrews has not told us about Enoch. There's something all the rest of the New Testament or the Old Testament has not told us concerning Enoch. They didn't tell us that Enoch was also a prophet. They didn't tell us that Enoch also prophesied. Once again, remember that there are revelations in the New Testament that gives you information by inspiration that you didn't get in the Old Testament. I told you yesterday that when you think about uh, the two men that confronted and opposed Moses, you don't have their names in Genesis in Exodus. You have their names when Paul was writing to Timothy. That's by inspiration. And then when you think about Noah, the preacher of righteousness, you see when you read uh, Genesis, it just talks about Noah. He found grace in the presence of the Lord and he built an ark. We are not told in Genesis that he was preaching. 
when you read what Jesus said in Matthew concerning Noah, it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days uh, that, that he will come. And then he talks there about his separation from the world, which is still about his righteous life, not about his preaching. It is when you come to Peter that you have that added information by inspiration that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And here now we come to Jude, and Jude has already given us an information by inspiration that we do not find in Deuteronomy concerning the burial of the body of Moses and concerning the fact that angel Michael and Satan had a um, kind of a disagreement or argument about uh, how to handle the dead body of Moses. Here now again, Jude is giving us another thing. He's telling us Enoch, the servants from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. You know something here? The first coming of Christ was first revealed unto Adam. The first coming. When God himself said that the seed of the woman will come and bruise the head of the serpent, of the devil. But the second coming was first revealed unto Enoch. And here is the first revelation. Far back at that time, and here is what Enoch had said, that Jude is not bringing up for us by inspiration, and he said, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Do you know that this was real prophecy? Because at that time, there were not uh, many saints, because it was just Enoch. We're not even told that his wife was a believer. We're not even told that his children were believers. You know that it was after him that eventually Noah came and the flood came and swept everybody away. There wasn't up to 100 saints, not up to 1,000 saints. And yet Jude is telling us that although at the present time with Enoch there were not up to 100, 1,000, Jude said the Lord will come at a particular time. Is the second coming when he will come with myriads of his saints. And when he says his saints, he just says in the original, will come with the holy ones. And it's a combination of angels and men. Holy angels and holy men. I want you to look at uh, Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all his holy angels with him. The Lord will come in his glory, and his holy ones, holy angels, will come with him. In Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Reading from verse 4. Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear... Then shall ye also, believing people, redeemed people, sanctified people, holy ones, appear with him in glory. Therefore, when the Lord will come, his holy ones will come with him. Holy angels will come with him. Not only that, we are told that the holy men, holy people of God will come with him. Let's look at the prophecy of Enoch. Come back to Jude. Come back to Jude from verse uh, 14. And Enoch also, the servants from Adam prophesied of this saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Here are some facts concerning the prophecy of Enoch. Number one, the Lord is coming. It is certain, it is sure, Satan cannot hinder him from coming. The Antichrist cannot hinder him from coming. And the politicians of the world and the kingdoms of this world cannot hinder him from coming. Jesus is coming again. Number two, he is coming with myriads, thousands of his holy ones, holy angels and redeemed men will come with him. Number three, the purpose of his coming will be to execute judgment on the ungodly. 
depraved men who are ungodly in thought, in word, and in deed. Divine judgment will be executed in the light of the revelation that they have received, which they rejected. Let's see the people that will experience that judgment and wrath and indignation of God. In Jude verse 15, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all the ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That is, the sinners, the backsliders, the apostates will be judged on the basis of all the things they have said and all the things they have done. It is not only what they have done, but everything that they have said that is ungodly, that is unrighteous, that is untrue, that is unscriptural, that is against the Lord and against his Christ. That's why you should always remember that every idle word that man shall give, they shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be judged, and by thy words thou shalt be justified. Therefore let us be very careful that our tongues do not utter anything that is untrue. Anything that is not according to the revelation and the truth, absolute truth of the Lord. Now in verse 16. It tells us these people that will still be judged. You know, he has been talking about the judgment from verse 15. It says, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own laws. Their mouths speaketh great swelling words. They are the people that have men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Jude leaves no doubt as to the identity of those upon whom divine judgment will fall. There are five in category. Number one, they are the murmurers. They silently, quietly spread the spirit of discontent. Before those people come to you to whisper their murmuring, before those people come to you to quietly pull you aside, and have you heard something? Before they came, you were contented with God. Contented with the promises of God. Contented with the plan of God for your life. Contented with the word of God as it is being preached. As soon as these murmurers silently and quietly come, they spread the spirit of discontent that you begin to get dissatisfied with the Lord and with your lot in the Lord. Number two, complainers. These complainers are not like the murmurers. They are those who openly, publicly criticize the will of God. They are the people, they are not quiet about it. They are not timid about it. And they are not creeping in quietly about it. They are not privately bringing anything. Openly and aggressively, they complain as they criticize the will of God. They see inconsistencies in the will of God. They say, see this and see this. Don't you see inconsistency there? They see inequalities in God's decisions. They say, look at this, look at that. Don't you see inequality there? They see injustice in the plan of God. They say, open your eyes, open your mind, and face the fact. Don't you see injustice in the plan of God? How should he do it this way? How should he do that way? And they're not afraid about anybody, whoever is there, whoever is not there. They openly, publicly criticize the will and the word and the mind and the plan of God. It says the judgment will come on the quiet murmur as well as the open criticizing complainers. Then he talks about a third category. He says they are slaves of their own carnal lust and sinful desires. Actually, they are not able to walk in the spirit. They walk in the flesh. 
They are not able to walk according to the commandment of God. They walk according to the dictate of their mind. They are not able to walk in the law of the Lord. They walk according to their own lust. Holiness does not have any sway in their lives. It's the depravity. It's the corruption. It's the evil. It's the sin in this world that has effect upon them. They are the slaves of corruption and the slaves of their own lust and the slave of everything that is supposed to righteousness and holiness. It says the judgment will come upon them. Number four, it says they are boasters, speaking grace well in words, speaking and acting with arrogance and pride. That will show you they have lost salvation. They have lost grace. When Christ comes into us, is the humble and meek Christ. He makes us meek. He makes us gentle and he makes us no more to consider our age, our education, our position, our stature, our achievement, our accomplishment, or whatever it is we call our. It makes us to prefer others before ourselves. But when pride comes in, when swelling comes in, when arrogance comes in, when we become pompous and haughty, and then when we are talking to people, we look down on everybody and we boast and speak great swelling words, wanting the praise of men. Then you know that we have gone away from the kingdom and you are one of the people that the judgment of God is waiting for. It's just around the corner. Number five, they are the flatterers who praise and encourage others to continue in sin and rebellion. They do it for one purpose, to gain advantage of the people they flatter. And yet, here we are today, learning about these apostates. And it is something for us to desire, to wish that we will never be apostates. But we have our part to play. We do not know how short, how long it is before the Lord will come. And sometimes we think that he may not come so soon. Because, you know, in the time of Noah, he started saying, the flood is coming, the flood is coming, the flood is coming. One year passed and the flood did not come. Ten years passed and the flood did not come. Twenty years passed and the flood did not come. Fifty years passed and the flood did not come. Who knows? The very next day when the flood will come, Maybe Noah still went out preacher of righteousness and say, there is still chance, the flood is coming. You have been saying that thing now for more than 100 years. And the flood has not come. Leave me alone. If you are fanatical with something coming, let it come on you. I am free. Go away with your kind of terrifying message of doom. The following day, God said, Noah, enter into the ark. And Noah must have said, so much room in the ark. Who will go with me there? Your wife, your sons, their wives. Only eight of us. There is more room. The men are not ready. Replace them with animals. And then the goats and the sheep and the lion and the birds, they started coming in. And the people were seeing him. It wasn't done in a secret place. They were seeing him. Maybe they were laughing. Maybe they were jesting. Maybe they were saying, fanatical Noah. Old man. They tell us that when you become older, you begin to behave like a baby. It's gone back into the cradle. And then the Lord said, Noah, that's all right. Can I lock the door? I will lock it myself. So that you don't open it for anybody after I lock it. And God locked the door. And he took the key away. And the floods came from beneath and came from above. As if it was child's play. The flood started rising up. And the people that said it may not be, they started saying, it looks like this thing is true. Can we pray now? That ark is very big. I think I'll get a place there. And Noah has been talking to me before. I know that if he hears my name, he will open that thing. And they nod, you can check up when we get to heaven. They nod. You say you don't treat it there. They nod. And as they were knocking, 
Uncle, Noah, you remember me? You've been inviting me. Now I come. And Noah shouted from within. I'm sorry. The key is not here. The key is in heaven. You can't open at all. You can't help me. You allow me to drown. Look at my wife. I didn't allow her to respond before. Now I allow her. Let her come in. Noah said, I'm sorry. The door is locked. And who knows when the sound of the trumpet will be? Who knows when the Lord will say, Children, the end of history has come. The end of preaching has come. The end of Congress has come. The end of travail and labor has come. Now come up. And one by one, wherever we are, in the bush, in the village, in the town, in the city, in the nations, we begin to go up one by one. And then the people that uh, saw us before have been preaching to them. And they say, they jump, they want, to, they want to fly. They jump, they come down. And then they see us going one by one. And we have gone. And the radio is, uh, you know, taking it and television taking it. Some people have gone. We've, uh, we've lost thousands of people from Lagos, from Kaduna, from Ghana, from Kenya, from everywhere. We hear that the these people have gone, the fanatical people, the deeper people, the holiness people, they have gone. And then the people start praying, oh God, save me, oh God, save me. The door is locked. And that's why you are being told today, here is the word of God for you. It says, come my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy door before above thee and hide thyself. I see it one for a moment until the indignation be overpassed. The indignation is coming, the wrath is coming. Will you come and hide in Christ today? Will you come into the Lord Jesus today and say, Lord, here am I. Lord, here am I. I do not want to be lost. I do not want to perish with the gainsaying of Korah. I do not want to perish with Balaam. I do not want to perish with Cain. Today I am coming in. Today I am coming in. Today I am coming in. Come and receive the Lord today. Come and receive the Lord today. Come and receive the Lord today. The Lord is calling everyone. Will you not get ready? Will you not be prepared? Will you wait until the judgment will come upon you? If you miss heaven, you will cry. The rapture will take place any moment from now. Don't delay. Make your life right with the Lord. Make your life right with the Lord. If you miss heaven, you will cry. And you'll do more than crying. You'll cry tears, you will cry blood. If you miss heaven, you will cry. Why don't you come in today? Come, my people. The mercy of God is still calling you. The love of God is still calling you. The grace of God is still calling you. The spirit of God is still calling you. The church of God is still calling you. The bride of Christ is still calling you. Come. The spirit and the bride say come. Let him that heareth say come. And let him that is a thirst come and take the water of life freely. Call upon the Lord while he may be found. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thought. The wicked man forsake his ways. The unrighteous man forsake his thought. 
Let him come to the Lord. Come to the Lord. Come to the Lord. Come today. Tomorrow may be too late.